Hello, my name is Jeffrey Goodman, pastor at Salem Evangelical Lutheran Church in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. Our Bible study is entitled The Grand Narrative of the Bible. And in this Bible study, we look at the coherent and single narrative of sin and salvation, where Christ is found at the center of that entire story. We began in Genesis, and we now, today, will be looking at the final part of the Old Testament, the Minor Prophets. As we are want to do for each of our Bible studies, we will begin by praying the prayer given to us by Archbishop Thomas Cramner in the uh, first edition of the Book of Common Prayer. And so let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which Thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with Thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our preferred Bible translation that we've been using in this Bible study is the English Standard Version. And we have also been using as an additional textbook, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. And we're in the 10th chapter, looking at the prophets. We'll finish that 10th chapter today, and at the conclusion of our Bible study today, I will give you some direction about where we're going to next, which is the Gospels, and where we'll go next in Fee and Stewart's book. But as we begin, uh, we want to talk about some hermeneutical suggestions, uh, some ways to uh, be mindful when we are interpreting or reading or studying the prophets. And today we'll be looking at uh, two of the minor prophets. There are 12 of them. Uh, but this is kind of a, uh, an overall view of when you're studying the Bible and when you're reading the Bible and you're in the prophets, some things to be mindful of as you're reading them. Because as we've noted in previous Bible studies, to study the prophets is um, uh, an often challenging task. Uh, not everything is in chronological order. Um, a lot of times they are speaking of things that we're not exactly sure what they're referring to. Uh, and so here are some suggestions for you to consider as you are studying and reading the prophets. The first thing is, and this goes for the entire Old Testament, um, you want to read the chapter before and the chapter after. You want to know what the context of the chapter you are specifically focusing in on. Uh, you want to know what that context is. Um, and then with that, as we have mentioned in, in other uh, videos and Bible studies, you want to have your tools available. Uh, so you want to have your study Bible with you. And I recommend using the Lutheran Study Bible, which is put out by Concordia Publishing House, the English Standard Version Study Bible, which is put out by Crossway. Um, there are any number of study Bibles that bring together all of the tools that you may need to study. So um, that have commentary, that have maps, that have dictionaries um, and uh, concordances. Uh, these things are all helpful tools to have when studying the prophets. And so to have a study Bible is very helpful when you're going through this section of the Bible. So remember, when you are reading the prophets, um, first try to identify what the intent of the author is. Uh, what's the intent? What are they uh, initially trying to say? Uh, not what you interpret, but what is right there on the surface that they are saying. Um, beware. Beware of reading new insights into the prophets. Uh, beware of uh, new ideas that, that have never heard, been heard before, that, that somehow you've uncovered, or, and be careful when publishers do this, or clickbait on the internet, that say, like, a new code has been found in the prophets, or um, uh, the prophets say this about our time right now, and, and uh, you should click on this. Uh, beware of that stuff. Um, we want to read the prophets uh, with our tools that we have, with an idea of understanding God's Word. Uh, and we come to the text with reverence. This is God's word for us. Um, we don't come at the text with, um, uh, with, with our own built-in suspicions that we're going to prove this wrong or, or this doesn't really mean what it says now in my own day. 
that those are dangerous paths to go down. Uh, but rather, look at the text and understand that that text has been studied for countless generations. Look at that text and how it falls into the grand narrative of the Bible, the story of sin and salvation. After all, it is one coherent story. From Genesis to Revelation is one coherent story of the coming of God's kingdom, of the coming of Christ. And so be mindful of that as you're reading the passage that you have there before you. Um, also remember, and we talked about this last week, that the prophets are, well, can we say this, that they're artists. By that I mean the prophets are poets. They speak in a certain way. They have a certain way of, of organizing their thoughts and, and, and their phrases, their phraseology. That, um, there is also a sense that the prophets paint a picture for us. Uh, that they're artists. And so when an artist paints a landscape, uh, you want to think of, um, maybe think of a famous landscape uh, uh, that you can remember. And of course there are um, details in the foreground and details in the background. And, um, there's a dimension to the biblical text that the prophets are painting for us. Um, the Prophets speak in a time of immediacy, so bringing God's people to repentance or, or calling them to repentance in that moment there and now, but also they speak in a distance, perhaps in our own time, perhaps going forward beyond that, uh, perhaps in the time of Christ. Um, so there's always kind of an immediacy and then um, a distance. Uh, so you want to remember that when you're reading the prophets. And, and that distinction can often be very difficult as you're reading through the prophets to keep in mind. Um, we mentioned this last week, watch for metaphor. Uh, metaphor is where you use an image or a word to point to another image or another word, uh, maybe perhaps to a greater truth. Um, so be mindful of that. That's very common with the prophets. I want to suggest to you a couple of tools that you may want to consider in addition to those study Bibles that I recommend. Of course, um, to have a whole library full of commentaries is expensive. We recognize that. Um, but I want to point to you some tools that maybe you want to consider because uh, there are a number of commentaries that you can buy used uh, on eBay or, or Abe's Books um, or Amazon uh, that you may want to have on your shelf that will help you in your Bible study. And so uh, when we looked at Jeremiah, a couple weeks ago, uh, I recommended Theodore Lash's commentary on Jeremiah. Well, uh, he also, Theodore Lash, has a commentary on the minor prophets, which includes the two prophets that we're looking at today, um, Zechariah and Malachi. Uh, and this is probably one of the premier commentaries on the minor prophets. Um, Theodore Lash was, uh, uh, he died in the mid 20th century. He was a professor at Concordia Seminary St. Louis from 1927 to 1947. Uh, and as I mentioned, he also wrote the commentary on Jeremiah. Uh, Je those two commentaries, Jeremiah and this one on the Minor Prophets, I got them both used and uh, rather inexpensively. And I would recommend them, putting them on your shelf and, and using them in your study to guide you through uh, the reading of the prophets. Now, with that said, uh, we can go further back and you can buy uh, these uh, editions as well used. Uh, so Martin Luther's American uh, works. Uh, so these are Luther in English, American English. Uh, you can get the Minor Prophets, Volume 1, um, uh, which is Hosea to Malachi, and that's Volume 18 in the set. Uh, so you can consider that. So Luther was an Old Testament professor, uh, and you can go to some of his comments on the Minor Prophets. And then another resource you may want to consider is Volume 20 of Luther's works, Minor Prophets 3, which covers Zechariah. Um, to have Luther on your shelf, uh, you can't go wrong. Uh, he, he has some, some great stuff for you, and uh, you may find them helpful in your study of the prophets. We want to recognize that the Minor Prophets um, 
they're not minor in any way other than just their volumes are short. There's 12 of them. Um, they are the inspired word of God, and we want to be mindful of that as we're reading through them. Um, and they're important. They play an important role in the New Testament. Of course, uh, St. Paul in Romans, he, he quotes Habakkuk, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. He quotes him in Romans 3. Um, St. Peter quotes Amos in one of his famous sermons from the Acts of the Apostles. And of course, the wise men uh, were using the word from Micah, chapter 5, verse 1, uh, to guide them on their way to Bethlehem. So the minor prophets do play an important role in the New Testament. Um, today we'll look at Zechariah chapter 9 and Malachi chapter 3 and 4. Uh, there are 12 books uh, in all, so we can't get to all of them, but we're going to look at uh, those three chapters uh, today. And Okay, so let's take a look at Zechariah chapter 9. We're going to focus in especially on chapter 9, verses 9 to 12. This is the Old Testament lesson for Palm Sunday, and as you can see here, uh, and I'll read it to you, uh, it's very clear why it is the lesson for Palm Sunday. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey? And you can see there in verse 9 a clear allusion to uh, you know Christ entering into Jerusalem on a donkey. Uh, but we could also make a comparison to the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Um, the coming of the Lord on the last day. Uh, Zechariah is particularly concerned about uh, warning God's people of God's judgment and the coming of the Lord. Uh, it's interesting also to note that this king comes on a donkey. Uh, this is a humbling thing, uh, not as a war horse or uh, a chariot, and not in a powerful uh, beast of burden, but rather a humble donkey. Why? Because the king uh, is a servant. Uh, even Jesus will tell us that um, he has not come to be served, but to serve. Uh, if we look at verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bell shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Well, God rules not by the sword, but by his word. Certainly he rules through the sword, through government. Uh, but we know that the king who comes to us mounted on a donkey does not come bearing a sword and bringing violence with him, but rather he comes to bring the word, a word of law and gospel, a word to bring us to repentance and a promise of salvation and forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. Well, uh, we can see this in verse 11. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Um, that's, that's right. Uh, Christ sets us free by his blood shed on the cross for your sins and mine and in his glorious resurrection. Uh, eternal redemption is given to us by Christ's blood. And we read about that in Hebrews chapter 9. You can see these connections between Old Testament and New Testament. Um, in verse 12, Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare to you that I will restore to you double. Well, yeah. God blesses us doubly uh, through the victory of our Lord uh, by canceling our sin and vanquishing our death. And we reside in Christ as his children, as, as, as people bought at a high price. If we move ahead, it's outside of the lectionary for Palm Sunday, but if we go to verse 16 of the ninth chapter of Zechariah, on that day, the Lord, their God, will save them as the flock of his people. For like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his head. Uh, we are a royal priesthood purchased at a high price by the blood of Christ. Um, God seeks the salvation of the world through Jesus. 
And we see this, this uh, longing for this in Zechariah the prophet uh, in his own day and again uh, in the far distant future, uh, some 400 years before the first Christmas, before the birth of Christ. Let's move on to Malachi here. Um, Malachi is another one of the minor prophets. Uh, he brings to a close the Old Testament. So he gets the last word of the Old Testament. Uh, his identity is not very clear. Uh, the name Malachi means uh, messenger. So uh, we know that Malachi, the prophet, is God's messenger. And again, um, this apocalyptic vision of the coming one, um, calling God's people to repentance. Um, well, he shows up three times in our lectionary. Uh, interestingly enough, at Advent. Uh, and then two times uh, during ordinary time right before Advent in November. Uh, so today we have assigned to us Malachi chapter 3 and chapter 4. It's a short book. It's only four, verse, four chapters. And we're going to look at 3 and 4, not all of the verses. Uh, but let's look at verses 1 to 7. Uh, this shows up on the second Sunday of Advent. And um, it's written, if you recall from Advent, Advent um, is all about preparing the way for the Lord. Uh, and so it has a heavy focus on John the Baptist. And so here we are, the first verses of chapter 3 of Malachi. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of his covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So there's this expectation of the one who is to come, and the one who is to prepare the way. Uh, and we know that to be John the Baptist who prepares the way. Uh, verse 2 here. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And uh, indeed, uh, Christ is coming to us, uh, not only to bring us salvation, uh, but to call us to repentance. It's the first word that he preaches. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, this verse 2, Martin Luther writes this, Christ is not merely the uh, purifier, but also the purifying agent. He is not only the blacksmith, but also the fire, not only the cleaner, but also the soap. Um, interesting comment from Martin Luther there. Uh, verse 5, Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages. Um, we talk about this all the time with the creed, don't we? Uh, in the second article of the creed, I believe that he will come to judge the living and the dead. Uh, this is an aspect of Christ's return to us. And, and uh, we who are Christians, who have been... Uh, redeemed by his blood, who are a royal priesthood in the name of Jesus, we have nothing to fear when Christ comes to us. Uh, those who do have fear, are, are, you see them here, the sorcerers, uh, the adulterers, uh, uh, the liars, the oppressors. Um, yeah, um, we do not fear the coming of the Lord. In fact, we look for it. Um, there's a part of our liturgy in one of our Holy Communion liturgies where uh, during the communion prayer, we'll say Christ uh, is risen, Christ will, will come again. Um, we look forward to that as Christians. Uh, and it is a hopeful thing that we look forward to his return. We are expecting his return. And so Malachi points us to that. He pointed God's people to that then, and he points us to that now. And there you can see that, that foreground and background uh, of Malachi as it relates to the coming of Christ. Well, if we look at chapter 4 of Malachi, uh, verses 1 to 6 are the uh, lectionary lessons uh, that are assigned in uh, ordinary time in late November towards Advent. Again, this, this coming of the Lord. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked. 
that they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. And again, uh, God's people uh, have nothing to fear of the coming of the Lord. We look forward to it. Uh, but those who have eschewed God's law, those who are unrighteous, who are not interested in the ways of the Lord, who do not call upon the name of Jesus, well, um, there is great trembling and fear to be had with that. As we move forward to verse 5, chapter 4 of Malachi, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Well, many folks have interpreted this, uh, this coming of Elijah the prophet, who, by the way, Elijah the prophet was taken up into heaven. Uh, you can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. This pro great prophet of the Lord is taken up into heaven. Uh, and here we have from Malachi that he will come before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Well, uh, again, the connection to John the Baptist there. Um, uh, John the Baptist was often seen as uh, an image of Elijah. Uh, Elijah who is to prepare the way for the great day of the Lord. Uh, and indeed, the, the coming of the Lord is Jesus. And we also see Elijah show up in the New Testament at the Mount of Transfiguration. So you can look at St. Matthew chapter 17, verse 3 there. Uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, we have Moses and Elijah, the great lawgiver and the great prophet, uh, along with Jesus. So all of the law and the prophets hang upon the teachings of Jesus. They all point to Jesus. Uh, and we see that at the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, so we can see how this uh, prophecy of Malachi, who, uh, again, uh, in the foreground to God's people in his time, and, of course, in the time of Christ, that we see this also fulfilled. Uh, he gets the last word of the Old Testament. Um, he says in verse 6, And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So, um, when the Lord comes, he will restore the family of God. Uh, a family forged in love of God, first and foremost, uh, given to us in Jesus Christ. And so then, as Malachi goes quiet there, in chapter 4, verse 6, we have this long period of time, uh, 400 years, where the prophets cease to speak. Uh, so uh, there's a lot that happens during that time. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of historical events significant historical events that occur. Uh, one of those great historical events and characters is Alexander the Great, who's, as he battles his way through um, the entire Mediterranean world. Uh, along with that uh, significant character in time, uh, we have the production, the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into the New Testament Greek, the language of Alexander the Great, as he brought the Greek language throughout the Mediterranean basin. The Old Testament is translated by 72 Jewish scholars into the common language of Greek. Uh, and that is often the scriptures that Jesus uh, reads hey, so next and from, we're going to as well as the other New start Testament our look uh, at the authors. New Testament, and we're going to start um, in the Gospels. Uh, so next is, time we uh, want to be in chapter 7 place to stop there because then book, How to Read the our Bible next Paul's time book, and you want to read uh, have, uh, chapter 7, hear pages 132 to 134. One can argue that John the Baptist, as so promised by Malachi, in, in the is reading. the last of the and Old Testament prophets. you have prophets. the lessons laid out for you from Matthew, Mark, the new uh, and two lessons from John Jesus for next Christ. week. And we'll begin with the, way the, for the coming uh, beginnings of, of the Gospels. Uh, just as Scripture so promised. So thanks for joining me today. I uh, wish you all the best. God bless you and keep you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.